Good morning, Parkway Church. Uh, if we have not met, I am Lee. I'm the new guy. I'm not sure at what point I stopped saying I'm the new guy. It's a little high up. That's all right. Um, but it's only been like six weeks or something, so I'm still going to say it one day. I'll just get up here and we'll stop saying it. Um, I think it is in the providence of God that today, when the Dallas Cowboys play the Chicago Bears, all you Texans have to listen to a Chicago boy talk for a good 45 minutes. So uh, you can thank the Lord for that. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm from Chicago. I, uh, I went to college there. And when I was in college, I did a study abroad trip in kind of around the Mediterranean. So we were in Israel, we went to Turkey, we went to Greece, and we finished in Rome. And one day, at the end of that trip, my buddy Luke and I, we had done this kind of eight-week study abroad thing together, and we were just doing some touristy things, enjoying Rome together. We're just kind of walking down the street in Rome. Uh, And one of the things that had been drilled into our heads by literally everyone who could talk to us about it was you got to watch out for pickpockets in Rome. Rome is full of pickpockets. Apparently, like, the world-class best pickpockets reside in Rome. So uh, we were walking on the street, and we saw one of our professors, one of the leaders of our trip uh, up ahead. He was a theology professor. He was walking the same direction we were, so we were behind him. Uh, and we'll call him Dr. Mike, not because that's his name, but because I'm not sure what the rules are in a sermon when you talk about someone without asking their permission and the story doesn't make them look good. So we'll call him Dr. Mike. So Dr. Mike, I love Dr. Mike. He's a great guy. He's one of the professors I was closest with in college, actually. He's a theology professor. But for the purposes of this story, the important thing to know is Dr. Mike is a pacifist, or at least he said he was. And Luke, my buddy and I, we were walking down the street, and he turns to me and he says, let's go pickpocket Dr. Mike. And I'm like, I'm a good friend. I'm like, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? And I'll, I'll watch, you know, I'll, make, I'll keep the coast clear, or whatever, you know. Uh, and so Luke, uh, well, I should say this. So Dr. Mike, like most theology professors, not known for their fashion sense, is rocking some cargo shorts with the big pockets on the side, you know what I'm talking about? And you can see his wallet, like this huge bulge. And it's like unsnapped. It's like, come on, man. Like, you know we're in Rome, right? Um, so it, the, so the, the fruit is ripe for the picking, right? And so Luke, like most Christian college students, is not known for his pickpocketing abilities, uh, runs up, sticks his hand into the pocket, and tries to run away while grabbing the wallet at the same time. And his hand gets kind of stuck, And Dr. Mike grabs him by the collar, pulls back a big fist, and is literally half a second from sending my friend to the hospital. And uh, fortunately, he recognized Luke before landing the punch. He realized this is one of his students, so he probably shouldn't punch in the face and send to the hospital. Uh, And we joked about it, and we laughed, and it was was great. Um, Why do I tell that story? because people are not always who they present themselves to be. I love Dr. Mike. I think he's a great guy. He's a great uh, theologian. He's a great theology professor. He is not a pacifist. Whatever he tells you, it's not true. He's not a pacifist. And sometimes when someone's self-identification is proven false, it's funny, like a theology professor who says he's a pacifist, who almost punches a student. That's funny. But sometimes... The hidden truth isn't funny. Sometimes it is deadly. And that's what we're going to find in our passage this morning. Jesus is going to warn us against a particular kind of person who is not who they present themselves to be. Someone who presents themselves as a sheep, something innocent and harmless, but who is actually a wolf. So let's pray, and then we'll dive into God's Word. James chapter 3, verse 17. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Father, I pray you would give us that pure wisdom. You would give us the pure truth of your word that we would understand it, that we would hold fast to it, that we would not be taken captive by falsehood, and that from 
that pure truth would flow peace and joy and grace. Father, we pray you would protect us from liars and enemies who would seek to devour and consume your people. Use your word this morning to that end, we pray. Amen. So last week, Jared started for us this kind of final section of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're new, we're going through Matthew, and we are here in chapter 7. And last week, Jared uh, kind of, like I said, introduced this new section where Jesus talks in these really stark, dichotomous terms. And kind of the, the governing analogy there at the head is the narrow gate and the broad way. So these this these two choices before all of us of how we're going to live our lives, the easy path, the broad way with the, the neon lights uh, and the big crowds that leads to destruction, or the narrow path that's hard to find and it's difficult to walk that leads to life. In our passage today, Jesus kind of takes a step back from those two and warns us about those who would deceive us and make us think that this narrow path is actually, or sorry, that the broad path is actually the narrow one. That if you're walking on the broad path, it's, it's actually okay. Maybe you're on the right path after all. And he starts off, verse 15, with a warning. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. Now, immediately that might sound a little odd to our ears. Uh, if, if you read most of the rest of the New Testament, you're probably thinking, why does he say beware false prophets? We're used to hearing Uh, you know, false teachers, false pastors. Why does Jesus say false prophets? So just as a a little aside, I think it's helpful for us to think about this. And I think there's two big reasons Jesus uses the word prophets here. The first is the historical reality. So the fact is simply the church does not exist at the time Jesus is preaching this sermon in Matthew chapter 7. Church begins at Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and then the Spirit comes and the church begins. So the office of pastor-teacher, uh, which Paul, Paul identifies in Ephesians 4, doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist. We're still kind of in this in-between, between the old and the new. And so Jesus is just using a term they would be familiar with. And the second reason, though, is the theological reality. So in the Old Testament, a prophet is, in some regards, the top of the theological ladder. It is a div- he is a divine mouthpiece, someone who speaks, and when he speaks, he can say, thus saith the Lord. And they communicate on behalf of God to let people know what God thinks of their behavior, what God thinks of any given situation. And so you read the prophets, uh, read either the narrative prophets like Elisha and Elijah, or you read the the writing prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and that is often what they do, and they will say, the sovereign Lord says. So a rejection of a true prophet is actually a rejection of God himself. I know I said there's, there's two reasons. I'll actually give you a bonus one here. There's the historical reality. There's the theological reality. There's also the contextual reality. I think Jesus is probably talking also about at least a subset of the group he talks about in the next passage. So look at verse 22. Jesus says, On that day when he returns, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? So there's this group of people who appear to be doing God's will, who may even purportedly prophesy on behalf of God, claim to speak his word to his people, and yet who are false. So there's the historical, the theological, and the contextual realities there. And just a heads up, I'll be using false prophet, false teacher, false pastor, all kind of interchangeably in this sermon uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, But we do live after the birth of the church. We live 2,000 years after Pentecost. And so most of those who claim to speak God's word to God's people today are often called pastors or teachers. And... Uh, I feel good about doing that too because the Bible does it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes, first looking at history, the Old Testament, but false prophets also arose among the people, now looking to the New, T- New Testament era, just as there will be false teachers among you. So he's equating the two in large res- respect there. So I'm going I'm to use them interchangeably. 
part of the reason I even spend two minutes kind of going through that is I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, when you're reading your Bible, to pay attention to the details. Why does he say false prophets? That's different than what we might expect. It's different than what we see in other places in the New Testament. So why do we need to beware false prophets, Jesus? Why? Verse 15, beware of them who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. False prophets are those who are deceitful and dangerous, and they're especially dangerous because of their deceit. We are not talking here about Islam or secular liberalism or like the obvious, the obvious lies that are out there. They, sure, they're dangerous, but they are not as dangerous as the enemy you don't know. What makes these people dangerous is they pretend to belong. They, they cover up their lies with this Christian veneer, this sheep's clothing, and then they devour and destroy the flock. Now, I will, in a few minutes, get to, I guess, some of the spicy stuff later on. I will name some of the names of the wolves I think you need to beware uh, in our culture, in our world today. But first, I want us to simply sit in this warning, brothers and sisters. Hiding among the people of God, wearing the right clothes, saying the right words, doing the right deeds, there are wolves. There are wolves. It's easy for us to say, you know, okay, Islam, secular liberalism, wrong, bad, no. That's easy. But there's also a danger in thinking that as long as we don't believe those things, we're doing just fine. The worst place you could be is on the broad path and think you're on the narrow one. Simple fact that someone wears a Christian name tag, that a book is on the shelf at Mardell, that a preacher has some kind of following is not enough reason for you to listen to them. We need to beware. We cannot walk around with our heads in the sand. There are wolves who would love to convince you that you're walking on the right path when you're not. So instead, false teaching must be exposed. It must be rebuked. As Jude says, we must contend for the faith that was once for all delivered for the saints. We must contend. So complacency is not an option. We, we must contend uh, for the truth. We must be a truth people. And contention, is, it's, a, it's not a fun word today, is it? Controversy, engaging in difficult debate, in, in difficult uh, argument can be a painful, awkward thing to do. But we must contend for the truth because our God is truth. And we want to worship the true God as he truly is. So it's not, it's not, simply, it's not simply we want to be right. We do want to be right. But there's a problem with the wolves. That it, you actually, it doesn't really come out in the, the ESV here. But the, the word there for ravenous, ravenous wolves, appears four other times in the New Testament, and every other time is translated robber or, or thief. So it's not just the wolves which do what a wolf does, which is to devour and to destroy. It's also that they rob God of the glory he is due. Truth matters because worship matters. We want to worship the true God as he truly is. But I seriously doubt... Any of you are sitting here thinking, you know, I'm not so sure. Complacency sounds like the better option. You're saying beware of false teachers, but come on, we don't need to do that. Like, none of us are thinking that. But we might, we might still believe that and actually practice that in ways that we don't realize in our lives. So in my experience, that kind of complacency is often hidden under the language of mission, so you've heard or maybe you've said, we need, to, we need to preach the gospel to the lost. We need to evangelize. We need to be engaging in prayer. If we spend all our time worrying about false doctrine, man, we're never going to get anything done around here. And there's a heart to that that I do sympathize with. It is true if we spend all our time worrying about false doctrine, false prophets, false teaching, we never will fulfill the mission. But the problem is we have to, if we're going to evangelize, we're going to share the gospel, invite people to know Jesus, we need to know which Jesus we're inviting them to. Is it a watered-down 
Never preach judgment, Jesus? Is it a harsh, only preach judgment, Jesus? It, it might seem like we're splitting hairs sometimes when we're, when we're doing theology, when we're talking doctrine, but it is so crucial for the sake of our mission that doctrine precedes mission. Otherwise, we don't even know what the mission is. We don't even know what we're doing. We don't even know who we're inviting people to know. I remember uh, one time I was on staff at another church, uh, and there, in, kind of in our town, in our area, a bunch of the, the solid evangelical churches wanted to do a big, big kind of church unity event, have a one morning Sunday service all together. I think they were going to gather in like a big stadium or something. Uh, and uh, the heart behind it, I think, is great. Church unity, we, we shared the same gospel with the other churches we, that were hosting it. We knew enough about them to not be like, oh, I'm not so sure. But when our senior pastor asked them, you know, what's the statement of faith for the event? Their answer was Jesus. Which sounds great. Jesus, great. We want to be about Jesus. We're all about Jesus. We preach Jesus. If we don't preach Jesus, we're doing something wrong, right? But that's not a statement of faith. Which Jesus are we talking about? If, if the statement of faith for our unity is simply Jesus, a Mormon, I guess, church could hop in and say, yeah, we believe in Jesus. We're here. We can, we can participate. Striving for unity is great. We should strive for unity. Mission is great. We should strive for the mission God has called us to. But if we do that with vague theology and overlook substantive disagreement, it is no unity. It is no mission at all. Sometimes we have to fight a fight. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, the maybe the biggest, one of the biggest theological fights, theological disputes in the history of the church was fought over one single letter. One single letter. So in the fourth century, we're going all the way back, for, not all the way, but pretty far, fourth century, Athanasius, Fun name, if you've never heard of him, he's an awesome guy. Athanasius argued that Jesus was the Son of God who was homoousios with the Father. I did not just have a stroke, okay? It's okay. Homoousios, there's the word for you. Is that, I think it's, I might have misspelled. No, that's right, that's right. He was homoousios with the Father, which means of the same nature or being. So he and the Father are God. God, not like Separate gods or anything like that. They are both truly God. They are of the same nature or being. Jesus really is God. That's what Athanasius was arguing for. On the other side were his opponents, known as the Arians, who argued that Jesus was homoi usios with the Father. We got that one slide up there for you? It's coming, I'm sure, eventually. Just wait. It's all right. Anyway, oh, there you go. If you look, literally the difference is one iota, literally one iota, the Greek letter I, is the only difference between these two. And it might seem minor, but Athanasius stood his ground. Sorry, I didn't tell you what homoiousias, homoiousias meant. Uh, it means of a like or a similar nature. So homo, homoiousias, wow, this is tough. Homoiousias means Jesus and the Father are both truly God, of the same nature or being. Homoiousias that he's of a similar nature. He's kind of like God. You know, like maybe not quite God, but he's, he's great. He's really close, but he's not quite the same. Athanasius stood his ground because he knew that both worship and salvation were at stake. If Jesus was not truly God, if he was just like God, then he could not reconcile us to the Father. And he should not be worshipped as God. A single iota of difference and the glory of the eternal God was at stake. So brothers and sisters, we must be on guard and ready to expose false teaching for the glory of God. I do want to give you one warning with that. So I know I'm new here, but from my experience in other Reformed churches, churches that love sound doctrine, love theology, and from what I know of, of my own heart, there's a particular pitfall we're going to be prone to in this regard. So a church that loves 
theology, often there is with that love an ungodly love for debate that can tailspin into divisiveness. You know your history, you know your theology, that's great, I love that about you. But wielding those things as weapons can undermine the very truth you aim to defend. John Piper says, Some controversy, some debate over doctrine, some controversy is crucial for the sake of life-giving truth. Running from it is a sign of cowardice. But enjoying it is usually a sign of pride. That's a danger. That's a real danger. Brothers and sisters, do not love controversy. Do not love debate. Do not love fighting these fights. Do not love contending for the faith. Do not be a hammer seeking the satisfaction of crushing a heretical nail. It is possible to defend the truth with your mouth and undermine it in your heart at the same time. I told you last time I love J.R. Tolkien. Uh, Basically anything he's ever written, I love it. Uh, You're getting two Tolkien quotes today. Congratulations, it's a two-for-one special. In The Lord of the Rings, Faramir, who's the noble captain of Gondor, he's awesome. In the books, sorry, in the movies, he's kind of portrayed as conflicted. That's not actually quite right. In the books, he's just good. He's a good guy, through and through. He's noble. And he's got a quote I love. He describes defending his city, and he says, I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Brothers and sisters, do not love your argument for its cleverness, Do not love the thrill and the victory of debate. Love only that which they defend. Fill your mind. We have to engage in controversy. We have to engage in debate and and discussion over real substantive theological questions. But we cannot do that unless we are filling our mind, our hearts, with the joy of knowing who our God is with his glory and his goodness and his grace and his wisdom and his beauty. Let that be what leads you to hate falsehood, to hate the lies of the enemy, to hate the lies of false prophets. It's not about you scoring a point or winning an argument. It is about the king of the cosmos receiving his due. So with all that in mind, in view of Jesus' command... Beware, false prophets, I do have a duty to speak to you clearly about some of the wolves that are among the sheep, kind of in our evangelical climate. It's it's hard to do this today because if we were living a thousand years ago, I could say, that church down the street that, you know, your neighbors go to, but now everyone's got Twitter and Instagram and uh, false prophet, false teaching can can flourish in in many ways. Uh, Two quick things about what we can expect from them. Just in the context of Matthew 7, I don't have these verses on the screen, but if you look at your Bible, in verses 13 and 14, before what Jesus is saying here, from that, we can expect the wolves in sheep's clothing to encourage what is more popular and easier, the broad path. And from the the verses that come after, 21 through 23, we can expect these false teachers to say and do things that look Christian, but that, that they themselves will lack a knowledge of the true God. So, I'm only going to mention four. Four false teachings I think you need to be aware of. They're actually going to come in two pairs. Some of you will wish I listed ten more. I probably could. Some of you will feel like four is too much. That's okay. First, uh, I'm going to call it under-spiritualized Christianity. Under-spiritualized Christianity. The, The primary example of this would be what is commonly referred to as the prosperity gospel. I call it under-spiritualized because salvation in the prosperity gospel, again, I use quotes on gospel because it's not a gospel, it's not good news. Salvation is all about your earthly gain. It's about health and wealth. It's not about your eternal soul. It's not about your, your spirit being drawn to be made, made like the, into the image of Christ. It's about earthly gain. It's about this world, making the best of it that you can. 
fulfilling your goals. It is under-spiritualized. One of the really formative things for me when I was a young Christian, I've heard Jared talk about when he was a young Christian, he listened to like a lot of sermons. I didn't do that. Uh, I, listened, I listened to a lot of Christian rap, uh, which I love and I still love. So uh, one of my favorite rappers is Shai Lin, who's a pastor out in Philadelphia. If you want to learn theology, pretty much any album by Shai Lin, especially his lyrical theology albums, phenomenal. Anyway, wasn't going to say that, but I'll stop talking about that. Anyway, one of his most famous songs uh, is called False Teachers, and he's very directly, very explicitly, going, literally explicitly like naming every one of the ones he can think of. Um, going after prosperity preachers. And I, I won't wrap it for you. Sorry to disappoint you. But here's one part. He says, Don't be deceived by this funny biz. If you come to Jesus for money, then he's not your God. Money is. Jesus is not a means to an end. The gospel is he came to redeem us from sin. And that is the message forever I'll yell. If you're living your best life now, you're headed for hell. Fun fact, that's not related to really anything I'm saying. Carl and I were rapping to each other in our office this morning, or not this morning, this past week, and Carl is a really good rapper. Uh, he might actually, he might be a better rapper than I am, which I know is shocking because you're thinking, you know, Lee, you're young and hip, and Carl's Carl. Um, <laughs> but it's true, Carl's a great rapper. You should tell him I said that. Anyway, so first, under-spiritualized Christianity. Number two, hyper-spiritualized Christianity. I told you they're coming in pairs. Hyper-spiritualized Christianity. There is uh, a neo-charismatic movement that in my subjective sense is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, often, much of it that at least from what I know is being exported by Bethel Church out in Redding, California. There is a focus less on Christ and more on some kind of mystical power Christ gives. So there's an unhealthy emphasis on healing ministry, on prophetic words, on charismatic gifts, so that these things become really the focus. This is what we're after. These things, and we'll give lip service to Jesus. We'll, we'll, want to, we'll try to give him you know, some, some name credit, but ultimately we want the power that he can give us. I think of Simon Magnus in the book of Acts, who's a great example, or I guess a bad example, of that. Jared asked us a great diagnostic question last week. He probably stole it from the rap song I just quoted, but he just didn't want to tell you that. But the question is, is God the means or the end? Is he the means or the end? Is he the one you're going towards? Is he the one you want, the, the desire of your heart, the, the heart of everything that we try to do as Christians? Is he the end? Or is he just the means so you can get something else out of him? Hyper-spiritualized Christianity makes him nothing more than the means to some perceived power. All right, numbers three and four are two kinds of one error. Uh, I, I could call them a million things. Some of them, I will call them, are unhelpful. Uh, it is the, they are both the error of hyper-politicized Christianity. Or uh, you could also call them two kinds of syncretism. Now, again, to describe these two, I will use terms I find unhelpful. I will tell you why I think they're unhelpful, but I'll hopefully explain what I mean by them. If you're angry at me, we can talk. I'd love to get coffee, whatever. That's fine. So on the one hand is the conservative error of Christian nationalism. Now, I think that's an unhelpful term, like I've already said twice now. Because some people will say it's Christian nationalism if your faith informs how you vote, which is dumb. Because your faith should, it can and absolutely should inform how you vote. That is not Christian nationalism. What I'm talking about is the false teaching in which there is a syncretism, there is a blending between the mission and the identity of Christ's church and the mission and the identity of the United States. Jesus did not wait almost 1,800 years after his ascension to finally get to work on his mission and his kingdom. The United States is not the fulfillment of what Jesus had been longing for all this whole time. Those two are not the same, the church and the country. America could collapse as a nation next week 
and the mission of God would not change in the slightest. Okay, that's the conservative heir. I told you there's a liberal, oh, I didn't say it, but there's a liberal heir on the other side. To use another unhelpful term, this is our fourth false teaching, woke Christianity. Again, this is an unhelpful term because some people think it's woke to say racism exists and racism is bad. Obviously, that's true. Racism exists, racism is bad. That's not woke. If you think that's woke, then you're wrong. The false teaching I'm talking about, which is funny how these work, is similarly a syncretism between secular ideals or ideologies and the mission and tenets, the identity of the church. So one day, Revelation 7 says, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will gather around the throne of Christ and sing his praises with one voice. Many tongues, one voice. It's one of my favorite passages. But that only happens because of the gospel. That diversity only exists Because Christ has purchased for himself a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He is bringing that kingdom one day. If we try to manufacture that diverse reality with uh, ungodly ideologies, it is not the real thing. We actually thwart it from the start. If we take the gospel out and try to replace it with some Marxist or other secular ideology trying to manufacture what we think we need to be doing, it actually undermines the very thing we are trying to attain. We lose our ability to attain the glorious diversity of Christ's bride when he comes at the end. Now, obviously, I could say a lot more about any one of those four. Again, if you want to talk, I'd be happy to get coffee. You can email me about any one of them. If you have ideas about others, you have questions about, I'd be happy to talk. Um, But we've only gotten through one verse, and i got to watch my bears beat the cowboys today. So we will continue. Uh, Well, one more thing, one more thing. Notice how these work, right? So so I've given them to you in pairs to show you that you can fall off the narrow path on either side, right? The, The narrow path, or sorry, the broad path has room for both the hyper-spiritualized and the under-spiritualized. The broad path has room for the ultra-conservative and the extreme liberal. The narrow path has room for neither. Okay. I've identified the false prophets we need to be aware of. Jesus, though, gives us some tools to recognize them for ourselves because false teachings will continue to arise. Uh, The ones I've mentioned are ones that I think the fruit has, has been seen But there are other false teachings that we are not even aware of are false yet, and so Christ helps us recognize them. Verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can the diseased tree bear good fruit. Okay, here's the good news. The fruit of false prophets will expose them. Jesus does not say, you take a look, pay attention, you have to. He says it will expose them. It's a guarantee. You will recognize them. How? By their fruits. By their fruits. Before we talk about what that means, let's see what he does not say. He does not say, you will know them by how irrational their claims are. He doesn't say it's going to sound so crazy and you're going to be like, that's wrong. One of the scary things is that heresy makes sense. Heresy makes sense. Colossians 2, verse 4. Paul, he he summarizes the gospel and then he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Plausible arguments. There's a plausibility to false teaching. That's dangerous. You won't know them by how irrational it sounds. Nor does Jesus say you will know them by how unpopular they are. Lakewood Church in Houston, one of the biggest churches in, probably in the world, definitely in the country. The pastor, Joel Osteen, wolf in sheep's clothing. When Athanasius was, was fighting for the truth of Christ's divinity against the Arians, he was often, throughout his life, often fighting for the minority position. He's got this, oh, I love this. He, 
So vast swaths of the world were, were siding with the Arians, bishops, churches, all across the world were siding with the false teaching that Athanasius was opposing. And Athanasius, he's an amazing line. He says, if all the world be Arian, if all the world denies the deity of Christ, if all the world be Arian, then Athanasius against the world. I love that. That's my man. Anyway, Jesus does not say you will know them by their irrationality or their unpopularity. In fact, you can expect them to have a generally Christian flavor that makes sense, that people are drawn toward. It is the broad path and it is booming. Love wins. Sounds like a biblical statement until you put it on the title of a book denying the existence of hell. It sounds right. And yet it is false. None of those things will expose them. Instead, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. It is what they produce, the results, the products. Jesus is doing what he actually often does. He uses the same illustration later in Matthew. He's using an agricultural analogy, right? So a tree produces what it is. Grapes don't grow from thorns. Figs don't grow from thistles. At our, our previous home in Chicago, just before we moved here, We had this great backyard with a uh, line of trees kind of along the back fence. So you kind of felt like you were in the woods. It was great. We loved it, especially during COVID where we were just in the backyard all day. Anyway, uh, our first spring there, I was walking in the backyard in my bare feet, and I looked down, and my feet had turned purple. And I was obviously confused. The ground was squishy. uh, And after a little bit of research, we realized that Uh, we had several mulberry trees growing in our backyard, which are delicious, by the way. Uh, But when we bought the house, we had no idea that there were mulberry trees in the backyard. And we could, if we, I was thinking about it, if we could, we could have like, you know, got on Google and looked at each tree and be like, is that this one? It kind of looks like this. Oh, maybe it's, you know. But the fruit made it totally clear what the tree was. A tree cannot hide what it is when it bears fruit. It is the surest test to know what a tree is. In the Bible, there are actually many tests for false teachers. First John says a true prophet will confess Christ has come in the flesh. It's a theological test and measuring what they're saying against what we already know to be true. In Galatians, Paul warns against those who preach a different gospel. That's a, that's a test because heresy is any deviation, any innovation of the, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Those tests matter. The surest test, though, is time. It's time, the fruit that comes from the tree. What does he produce? What comes from his teaching? You will recognize them by their fruit. As as we see a teacher continue, as he continues to teach, as he develops disciples, the fruit will become more and more obvious. Right, just to be able to do this well, I think a great passage to have in mind is 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, I kind of think of this passage as uh, the life cycle of false teaching. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. Paul writes, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, there's a theological test, the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching that accords with godliness, there's the moral test, He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. So again, we see the theological test. Does their doctrine agree with the sound words? Is it an innovation on the faith, or is it the same faith? We see the moral test there. Does their teaching accord with godliness? Actually, that's how fruit often functions in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, John the Baptist said to the Pharisees in chapter 3, verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, show me by your life, your godly living, that you actually are turning from your sins. There's theological tests, there's moral tests, but both of them become clearer with time. False doctrine will bear increasingly more obvious, increasingly worse 
theological and moral fruit over time. It might start out close to the truth. It might start out like, that's a little weird. I'm not quite sure what I think about that. And a generation or two later, it's often very, very clear. Do they produce morally the things Paul talks about here? Craving for controversy, envy, dissension, slander. The surest test is time. And one of the ways that time functions, and that is also, I've already mentioned, uh, is listening to, uh, looking at the followers of a teacher. What kind of disciples does he produce? Who, who, who follows him? What do their lives look like? What kind of doctrine do they hold? What kind of godliness are they practicing? In Matthew 23, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. He says, you work so hard to gain followers, and once you do, you turn them into twice, twice as much a child of hell as you are. The next generation will always be more obvious. It's one of the encouraging things. It's one of the reasons I've, I've referenced church history several times already today is when you look at church history, the, the, follower, the next generation is so revealing. The followers of this guy turned out to be godly and humble and holding to the faith, and the followers of this guy got pretty weird. Like, what, what were they doing? Like, that's odd, you know? So time is where the fruit becomes clear. So we need to beware false teaching. We need to expose false teaching, but we also, brothers and sisters, we need to be patient. We need to be patient. The first and loudest voices may not be the right ones. This is why we cannot love controversy for its own sake. We don't, we don't need to be a people on the war path diving into every debate that we can find, because the fruit will expose them. We can be patient. We don't have to, again, be that hammer looking for a heretical nail to smash. God will make falsehood clear over time. So be patient. Be patient. That patience makes you uncomfortable, because the truth is, you know, if, if we're overly patient and we become complacent, we're committing the error I said at the very beginning we must avoid, but if that patience makes you uncomfortable, keep reading because Jesus has one more dimension to his analogy. Verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Not only will the fruit of false teachers expose them for who they really are, but their eternal end will expose them too. Jesus takes this tree and fruit metaphor that he's been working with in a direction that we probably didn't expect. It doesn't have to follow from what he's said so far. A diseased tree will be destroyed. That's weird. Jesus, we, didn't need to, we didn't need to go there. What's, how's, what's the point of that, Jesus? A diseased tree will be destroyed. Now, to understand what he's doing here, I need to teach you a little bit about Greek verbs. I know, you're like, we already did the homoousios, homoousios thing. Uh, but I know, just to strain your excitement for a second. In the New Testament, there's a, a grammatical phenomenon called divine passives. You're like, I don't care. I don't know Greek. Why are you teaching me how Greek verbs work? Again, restrain your excitement. It's okay. What that means, what a divine passive is, is when the author writes something and doesn't tell us who did it, who's doing the action of the verb, it's meant to make us think, to make us pause, and to realize that God is the one who does it. So, I'll give you two examples. If that didn't make sense, the examples hopefully will. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Peter, he talks about an inheritance. This is what God has given us in the gospel. It's a glorious passage. An inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Kept in heaven. Peter, who, who's, who's keeping it? it? It seems important to know who's keeping it. I, I want to know who's keeping it. It's really important. Who's keeping our salvation? Well, the answer we are meant to get to, by the fact that Peter doesn't tell us, the answer we are meant to find is that it's God who keeps it. God holds your inheritance forever in heaven. It cannot be taken from him. Another example. The book of Revelation is just shot through with these, by the way. If you read it, you'll be amazed how often John shows uh, God's sovereignty over evil using a divine passive, which is, again, a verb that we don't know who's doing it. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 9. The beast 
was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority. Was given by whom? Was allowed by whom? That, or sorry, yeah, was allowed to exercise authority by whom? That, that it seems important, and the answer is God. God is sovereign over everything that comes. Every bit of evil that could ever, we could ever face, God is the one who's sovereign over it already. It only does it because he let it. We have another example, the reason I tell you about divine passives. We have another example here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Who cuts it down? Who throws it into the fire? The answer is God. Jesus is promising eternal judgment for false teachers. Many false prophets may run rampant in our world. Heresies have sprouted and bloomed for 2,000 years of church history. And every single one of them will face the fires of God's judgment on the last day. And what that means for us is simple. If God is the final and definitive judge of false teachers, we don't have to be. I'm not saying don't, don't expose false doctrine. I'm not saying, you know, you know, sit down and don't worry about it. But we do not have to be the final and definitive judge because God is. And that, should be, that should be unimaginably liberating Brothers and sisters, evaluating every false teacher, especially, again, in the era of Twitter and, like, the Internet and all these things, evaluating every single one is hard, exhausting work. You've got these people saying, that guy's the Antichrist, and you've got these people saying, he's actually really helped me in my walk with Jesus. And you're like, what do I do? It's a headache. It is exhausting. But, but God will be the final judge. It doesn't depend On you, every wolf in sheep's clothing will be unmasked and revealed. So you can expose false teaching. You can do what God calls us to do. You can contend, as Jude says, for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And then you can rest. You can just trust God. Say he will have the final word. If I'm wrong, he won't be. Praise God. How comforting, how encouraging is that I promised you another Tolkien quote. Here it is. It's also from Lord of the Rings. It's Gandalf speaking. He says, It is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those wherein we are, so those who may live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have, is not ours to rule. Since I live here now, I've already mentioned, uh, I don't get to watch my bears, unfortunately. Today I will, which is great. I'll hopefully watch them win. Probably not. Um, but since I don't get to watch the bears games, uh, typically I will often just watch the highlights afterwards. And at that point, I already know who won, which in, when we lose, is less painful. But when we win, it's way less stressful because I'm like, oh no, they threw an interception. I know we win. It turns out great in the end. We're going to be all right. In the same way, brothers and sisters, rest and trust God. The final victory is his. As we've already sung, he will win the battle. And you will know them by their fruits. Quick poll question. Have any of you ever heard of the, I'll tell you, he's a heretic, the heretic Montanus? Raise your hand if you've heard of Montanus. Okay, just Jared and Keith. Good job. So, like three of you, good job. So the nerds in the the church, we know who they are. Montanus was a false prophet in the second, third, and fourth centuries. So we're talking hundreds of years of influence. I won't get into his theology, it would take a long time, but he had a long tenure as a false prophet, and almost none of you have even heard of him. The fruits were finally recognized as false. Brothers and sisters, this is why I love reading church history, because you realize there's all these heretics you've never even heard of that rose and fell 
and God was sovereign the whole time. They come and they go, but they do not last. But get this. There is another movement that has stood the test of time. A movement that began with the pathetic start of a crucified Savior on a Roman cross that got, its, got going with a bunch of farmers and fishermen laying down their lives, telling people the message of the kingdom, that that Savior died, rose again, and is ascended forever. That crazy story has lasted, has stood the test of time, and for, it has for 2,000 years, and it will stand on the last day. There's no earthly rationale for the success of the gospel other than the fact that it's really true. It's really true. It continues to bear good fruit. It continues. We see churches continuing to sprout and grow. We continue to see baptisms. God is still saving people. The the mission of Christ is still going and it will not stop. The fruit continues and it is good. So brothers and sisters, beware false teaching, be patient, look for the fruit, but above all, rest in the knowledge that the old, old story, our glorious gospel, is really true. Let's pray. God, it is amazing that you are so good. Father, this world is filled with devils, those who would threaten to undo us. There are so many, God, who would deceive, would devour, would seek to do us great harm, God, and you still preserve your people. You still care for us and you help us to see, identify the false teachers and hold fast to the truth. And we pray, God, for us as a church, we would Hold fast. That when we see lies of the enemy, we would expose them, we would rebuke them. But God, that we would also rest that we don't have to master all the tides of this world. That you will have your final say. God, you are good and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.